Last year we had Grant Likely at the much smaller Plug Fest we had last year, um, giving a bit of an update on what Linaro was going to look into and do with regards to UEFI for the next year. So I thought I'd go through a bit and talk about what we have actually done and also some ideas of, of future work that we want to do. Interrupt and ask questions at any time because it gets a lot more interesting that way. We're going to have a, a quick introduction and then go through a lot of the work that we've been doing this year have been around the Linux kernel. Um, but some of it's been within EDK2 itself, uh, a little bit around SET. Um, I'm going to talk about the platform tree that we're maintaining within Linaro to uh, what is it, augment the, the Tiana core tree with you know, complete uh, no frills platform builds um, and some future work that we're either going to do or would think it would be really good if, if we could do it together as a, as a community. The big thing really has been um, around implementing the basic Linux support for UEFI. Um, so around the runtime services support from within Linux, um, for the UEFI stubloader, which is executing the kernel as an EFI application, um, and is specifically within the ARM community, we have the coexistence of ACPI versus flattened device tree for hardware description. And we have, um, for several months now, um, working runtime services support for both 32-bit and 64-bit ARM platforms. Um, it's not been upstream yet, because um, there's a lot of opinions going back and forth. This is the way it works during Linux development. Um, the 64-bit support looks like it may be able to go into 316, which is going to be released at some point later this summer. Um, the 32-bit support, there's still um, certain arguments about minor aspects that may need to be changed in various ways. Uh, not necessarily in our code, but in other code that's required for our code to do the right thing. What we have done since um, we started this, though, and we have code that's already upstream with regards to consolidating the UEFI support within the Linux kernel. Because uh, historically, uh, obviously, IA64 was pretty much the first implementation for Linux that had an UEFI support. And then x86, x64 came in, um, and they were kind of doing their own thing off to one side. But so with two different architectures, you can kind of do that, and it's not too painful to copy code across when you realize something. But now we're up to four, and I think we're actually hearing people talking about bringing in direct support for SEND, which effectively brings you to at least five different architectures. So consolidating things, which is good. Um, the actual usage of the UEFI support in Linux is kind of um, not exciting. It, almost the entirety that it's used for is the get variable and set variable calls for uh, effectively configuring the, the boot menu and selecting boot order from within Linux. So the Linux UEFI stubloader is a mechanism that means that the Linux kernel image itself is now a valid UEFI application which is able to load the, the kernel proper, as it were, and execute that in a predefined way. Um, that's already become the default mechanism of booting on x64 platforms. Um, so we have that working on, on both 32 and 64-bit platforms. Again, not yet upstream, but anyone can access it, and we make monthly releases of the kernels within the NARA with it. It also enables more lightweight bootloaders for Linux, like the Gummy Boot or Refine, which are effectively, should I say, glorified um, boot menus um, that, that, that just execute GFI applications. And the good thing here is that the majority of this code we can share almost completely between the 64 and 32-bit ARM ports. And again, there's been consolidation with regards to x86 and working together there as well. Within the ARM community, it has been quite contentious over the past year with regards to flattened device tree versus ACPI. Um, we have historically, I mean, the ARM Linux community is all about embedded platforms. That's changing now, but in the embedded side, people got together a few years back, and we used to have a real bad story on the Linux side, really. You had a kernel image that would run on one specific device, and people worked really hard and fixed this. 
using a flattened device tree. And about the time when they feel, yeah, we did it, then, then we come in and say, yeah, we're going to use ACPI. Um, and that's not necessarily that appreciated. So there's a bit of politics in there. But what this means in practice is that we need to be able to support both. We will always have some customers who will not switch to ACPI. Maybe it doesn't make sense for their use cases. I think regardless, as long as we can bring ACPI into the ARM platform, then we can actually show them that, look, it works, and then they can make an informed decision. So coexistence, ACPI, and FDT is very important here. Um, thankfully, the design of UEFI makes this very simple. It's entirely agnostic. What we do is we present the device tree as a configuration table, and off you go. There's been a lot of discussion over something that is really a non-issue on the technical side. So one thing we actually did was have made sure that regardless of whether you're using device to your ACPI, we use the UEFI mechanism for reading the memory map to actually populate the, the memory pool for Linux. We've had some help as well. Mark Salter from Red Hat has been working alongside us to be able to do the 64-bit stuff in parallel with the 32-bit stuff. Um, and Matt Fleming at Intel has been very helpful. I mean, he's the maintainer of the EFI subsystem in the Linux kernel, and He's quite active and helping us and, and really keen to get all this together so that we can benefit from, from using the shared code base. So that's Linux. Any questions on Linux? So the operating system supports UEFI, but what about the hypervisor? Um, that depends on the hypervisor. So on 32-bit, we have a problem, right? Because the 32-bit ARM UEFI bindings do not describe how to enter uh, a kernel from hypervisor state because it didn't exist when the bindings were written. Um, there were some um, workaround patches that were sent around, but they were never merged into uh, Tiano Core. So that's something we're going to have to revisit this year. Um, for 64 bit, it's easier. Um, at least if you're talking KVM, um, KVM is just the Linux kernel, and on ARM64, if you enter the kernel from EL2, then it, it already has everything it needs to work as a hypervisor. Uh, we are looking into um, SAN as well on ARM, but those are the only two uh, hypervisors we're doing any work with in Linaro. On the EDK2 side, uh, the development we've been doing in the NARO so far has mainly been around the platform support. Uh, so we want to keep the, the platforms we have in our tree up to date with upstream changes. There's been some plumbing, uh, I call it, for being able to actually verify our Linux support. So we, we, had some, we have some patches in our tree that gives kind of a, a static dummy uh, SMBIOS table so that we can verify that all of the Linux tools work properly. FTT via configuration table, as I said, that sort of thing. Various bug fixes and, and issues we found while developing, and, and then I nag Olivier about that, and he fixes it, and it gets upstream, and then it comes back around the next time. But we do also have um, work underway. Michael, who sits over there, is working on a port to, uh, of um, Tiano Core to a dynamic QEMU slash KVM platform. So you can actually have for, for deploying in, in virtual systems that still want to run complete machines. The other thing uh, we're doing is we've been accepted as a mentoring organization for the Google Summer of Code this year. And one of the three projects we've had approved is porting UEFI to a low-cost embedded platform. Um, so we've opted for the $45 uh, Texas Instruments BeagleBone Black, which is Cortex-A8 based, so it's a 32-bit ARMv7, but it, to me, the price point of that development board is amazing because it makes it something that you can go out and buy just for fun. You don't even need to think about it. Um, and you know, I would be quite happy to see some crazy hobbyists showing up and, and starting to hack on Tianocore. SCT, um, I kind of wish I could say we've done lots, but we haven't. We can run SCT on our platforms tree. So far, we've been doing it occasionally, manually. Um, we will be starting to work on actually doing this continuously on, as part of our monthly release cycle. But we have started looking into actually using the GitHub tree now. And that's 
it makes our workflow a whole lot easier that we just have GitHub as a, a proper upstream and it fits in with all of our open source workflows. So hopefully we can start getting involved there a bit more as well. So I'm going to talk a bit about our platform tree, uh, which I mentioned before. We produce monthly builds of EDK2 um, with added platform support and any sort of feature development we're doing in EDK2 that hasn't gone upstream yet or occasionally that should never go upstream. Initially this was done in a fairly monolithic fashion and all management was kind of manual, but we've set up a new tree now and starting to automate the process a bit more because this year we are going to see many more member company platforms coming into Linaro and we need to be able to handle that properly. So I think that will be quite, um, quite interesting. We work exclusively with Git, so the, the, the flag, uh, people say occasionally that shout if you want Git, um, we only use Git. So it would be really helpful to us if the upstream could migrate to Git because the, using the subversion to Git gateways means that you don't actually get all of the benefits of Git and sometimes you get patches that are actually identical but they don't appear to it as it for Git. So that's kind of um, a little bit annoying. But in general, it works very well. So we can do everything we want to do with Git like we would expect to, um, but it would be even better if upstream was officially Git. At the start of every month, we pick a commit upstream as the starting point for that month's release. Uh, and that pretty much means I go in, I look upstream and see, ooh, those look like four really invasive, scary patches uh, that came in, and I'll, I'll just pick the commit before that. Or if nothing like that, I'll just take the top of tree. And then we rebase all of our various topic branches and add all the platform support on top and create a tagged release uh, and post some pre-built binary images uh, up to one of the Linaro uh, servers. You can have a look at our Git tree if you feel like it, it looks much like upstream Tiana Core, but with some additional stuff on top. Uh, and we would love to have more platform ports. Um, I think Grant hinted at this last year when he was presenting, but I would love to have a one, even one, non-ARM platform that, that we could have separately in there. Because one of the things we have with trying to gain more traction for UEFI in the ARM space. If we want to go down into the more embedded devices, the more mobile devices, people come to us and we say, you should look at UEFI, and they say, but there are no drivers. And that is an actual problem we have. So the more actual publicly available platforms we can have with just basic Ethernet drivers, basic special timers, whatever, it would be really good for us to help us drive UEFI into other uh, market segments. We're keeping things to one side because we're considering this to be prototyping and testing. Uh, we, our preference would be to have everything upstream. Future things. As I said, we have several new UEFI-based ARM platforms coming this year, both 32 and 64-bit. Uh, we need to keep integrating those into our tree. We need to look into what we're going to do about key management and UEFI secure boot on ARM in general. We've had some good discussions around that this week, um, but we, we need to not drop that ball, really. We need to get rid of the built-in Linux loader. It was handy, but we now have the, the subloader. We don't need a specific knowledge within Tiano Core of how to load a, a Linux image. So we should all just use either Grub or, or, or subloader. I would like to look into what we can do to simplify integrating device tree support into Tiano Core. Olivia's already doing some things that, that are going to be helpful there. Um, but as I said, in, in the ARM space, we really need to be able to support flattened device tree as a first class citizen as well. And then we have ports to um, the Zen on 64 bit ARM as well that we'll be looking into. Well, to be honest. Royce already started. Wish list. Things I would really like to see happen that aren't necessarily things I can do on my own. Um, I would really like to see BDS getting moved out of the Intel trees. It used to be an MDE module package and, and I would like to see it back there. CSM is going away. 
not quickly enough, but at some point it will go away. Um, so if we can just try to keep more towards a proper unified UEFI structure, that would be awesome. We want more common drivers. Um, as I said, we will keep adding things to our platform tree. If, if upstream wants our drivers and our platforms, then we're happy to, to get it in there, absolutely. But we need more. We, we, we need to reach critical mass. And there might be some things we can do about adding some more common helper protocols, like for flattened device tree management with libfdt. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's something we could do with SMBIOS to just simplify integration and dynamic configuration. Um, and people keep asking me about, is there anything we can do for IPMI? And I'm not quite sure what that means in the UEFI context, but they keep asking, so we should look. And that's about it. Any questions whatsoever? Um, currently, the platform ports we have are mainly the ARM limited the development platforms. So it's the various software models and the various development ports. Um, we have one or two Samsung platforms. We have um, Panda board still builds, but we haven't validated it in ages. Um, but we're keeping it in there because it still builds. Um, so what we're working on is some additional uh, Linaro member platforms coming in. But as I said, I, I would be happy to take any maintained platform support. Uh, as long as there's someone who's willing to go, if it breaks, I will fix it, uh, then I'm happy to take it into this tree. And if you say, well, I want all of this code upstream, then absolutely. So what, what we tend to do is, if we have any patches that we think are valid and valuable to go upstream, we will send them upstream, we will send patches to the mailing list. Most of it tends to be ARM specific, but not all of it. Uh, if it's ARM specific, Olivia will take our patch, it will come in, we'll rebase next month, and then we'll already have that patch coming in from upstream.